So welcome everyone, thank you for coming to my talk today, which is creating terrain models with Python, Blender, and Second Life. Um, anyone here familiar with Emacs? Yay, anyone here familiar with org mode? Emacs org mode? At least one person. That's how I did my presentation. So this is actually just an org mode uh, text file in Emacs with a um, something called org tree slide mode. So um, yeah, hooray for open source, very esoteric text editors. Um, so who am I and why am I giving this presentation? Um, I am all of the things that it says here, uh, writer, visual artist, vocalist, musician, filmmaker, scholar, or perpetual student, I guess. I should actually add a coder to that. Um, and then longtime explorer of virtual worlds. Um, I am very passionate about free and open source software and um, deeply appreciative of all the amazing variety of tools that are available to us. Um, thanks to the internet, of course, and also the tireless efforts of open source and free software developers. Um, there's a lot wrong with the internet, with social media and AI and all of these things, but open source, I think, the open source movement in general is one of those things that the internet has really um, helped to kind of, you know, push into the mainstream, so to speak. Um, I am currently, uh, my qualifications, I guess, uh, if you want to call it that, I'm currently doing an MS in Media Arts and Technology at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, which is a very non-self-explanatory program. It's a very strange program, but I won't talk too much about it. Um, and I previously completed an MA in Mass Communication and Media Studies at San Diego State, uh, and also a very convoluted MFA at CalArts uh, right up here in Valencia. So I did um, vocal performance and creative writing as the two sides on my MFA, plus integrated media, which is the sort of tech-focused concentration. So very convoluted, completely non-self-explanatory. Anytime anyone asks what I did there, it's always a long conversation. Um, and uh, the reason I kind of started doing these train models, of course, I've been a resident. Has anyone here heard of Second Life? Raise your hands. Most people, so not everyone. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about that and then go into Blender and Python and what I did with this. Uh, but I've been a resident of Second Life for 19 entire years, which is a little scary. Uh, I joined in March 23rd, 2005. The platform actually um, began or it was released officially to the public in 2003. I had beta before that, so I've been there not quite since the beginning, but almost. Um, again, very scary, so try not to think about how old that makes me. Um, this is just the link to my student bio on the uh, UCSB MAT page. Um, I'm not gonna like read this or go through all the links here, but that's just uh, sort of a little bit what I just said um, and some of the other things um, that I've done there. Uh, and then what I will actually do, just to start off, start us off, uh, especially since not everyone here was famili familiar with Second Life, um, I did a video essay a couple of years ago, just a three-minute video essay um, in Second Life that I'll show, and then I'll get into the main portion of the talk. My avatar goes past, my camera shall not follow. As it turns out, this divide is at the heart of a question that has driven me for decades. The question is this, at what point does my presence become less about who or what I am and more about where I am? Is there a difference? For someone else in the same virtual space, seeing me on their screen, the answer might be more straightforward. My avatar is how they know me after all, is how they see that I'm there. In some worlds or in some circumstances, they might even see me as no more than a name. The question is far more challenging when you consider that technology has given us so many new ways to know ourselves and to experience our surroundings, ways that do not necessarily match our experience in and of the physical world that we're used to. In Second Life, for example, there is the third person view, potentially for multiple directions, and a first person mode as well, called mouse look. While these assume that you're looking either at or from your avatar's position, it doesn't end there. You can focus on anything in the environment, zooming and rotating and panning as desired. You can also take advantage of hardware peripherals like a space mouse, similar to a joystick but with more axes, in order to steer the Second Life fly cam around, as I've done quite a bit while filming various videos, including my MFA thesis. Besides the cinematographic freedom involved, what I also find fascinating about Second Life is its mainland of contiguous virtual landmasses, this contiguity presumes a sense of place and perspective that is at odds with the design of most social VR platforms where smaller worlds, more self-contained, appear to be the order of the day. 
Now, this isn't to suggest that Second Life residents can't simply teleport across the grid at the touch of a button. We can, and often do. And yet, the mainland continents still possess a plethora of airports, marinas, roads and railways, even the occasional gas station, all of which speak to an impulse toward a kind of realism with many people choosing to acknowledge the virtual distance and traverse it at their leisure in a manner that is paradoxically in contrast to the platform's extremely flexible camera controls. Is the world itself perhaps an anchor grounding our experience when our avatars and their fickle points of view do not? I could talk much more here about this and other worlds, worlds which I've explored for more than 25 years and counting, but I should probably save that for another video. For now, I'll end by saying that one of my lifelong goals is to critically and creatively explore a variety of virtual spaces, asking questions about place, perspective, and interactivity, and how those concepts come together to define our virtual lives and how we express ourselves. So yeah, just that's a little bit uh, introduction to some of the concepts in Second Life. Again, you kind of saw the camera controls are very flexible. Um, and as you saw, sort of the maps showing um, there's very large land masses in Second Life. So I will close that. Um, so what is Second Life? Quite a few of you raised your hands and said you'd heard of it at least. How many people have actually used Second Life or been in world? One person, two people. A little bit, a little bit, okay. That's about what I expected actually, but um, it's still around. A lot of people think it's gone, but it's still around. Uh, but for those of you who haven't heard of it, who have never been there, and excuse my mouse keeps sliding down here, um, it is a shared persistent online virtual world um, of many, many thousands of people. Usually there are anywhere between like 30 to 60,000 people online at any given time of day, any given day. Um, and it is made up it's a persistent virtual world, like I said, so it's made up of thousands of different uh, regions uh, that are all laid out in the form of a grid, hence why a lot of times when you talk about the metaphor of Second Life's world, people call it the grid, a little bit like uh, Tron's world, if you've seen that, or Tron Legacy. Um, and each region is a square, in the shape of a square, 256 meters on a side. Um, and there's actually um, another resident who's been um, along. When I say resident, by the way, that's just the Second Life terminology for a regular user. Uh, there are also Linden Lab employees. Linden Lab is the company that runs and maintains it. Anyone you see in Second Life with the last name Linden, they're an employee of the company. Uh, there's also a group of independent contractors called MOLS, like the little animal, um, Linden Department of Public Works, and they do various projects for Linden Lab, and they'll have the last name MOL, but everyone else is a regular resident. Um, but one of the other residents who's been around a long time, and she's actually a professional statistician in real life, um, she's run something called Grid Survey, this database where she's gotten information about Second Life, uh, various statistics for it, including sort of this, the size of it. Um, and so you can see here, as of uh, like six days ago, about a week ago, um, the grid had almost 28,000 regions uh, totaling this um, you know, amount of uh, square kilometers. And then you'll see that some of them are actually directly owned uh, and run by Linden Lab itself, um, and others are private estates. Um, and you can just he see here, um, the only unfortunate thing about grid survey is it takes forever to load. Um, I don't think her machine is very good, but she has a lot of data, so I'll forgive her for that but uh, it will load eventually. But um, just to talk a little bit more about this, even when it says private estates, those are still basically rented or leased sort of from Linden Lab, the company itself. So this is not distributed. This is not decentralized. Um, there are open source alternatives to Second Life called OpenSim or Open Simulator that is actually an offshoot of Second Life uh, originally. And those can be hosted anywhere by different people. You can actually get OpenSim uh, like a grid of your own, whatever size you want on your own computer. But the Second Life grid itself, which is the most populated, uh, again, is all is hosted through AWS, um, Amazon Web Services, uh, run by Linden Lab. So the private estates here, that number, it's still sort of going through Linden Lab, but it's regions that are sort of paid for by other people. Um, oh, and here's grid survey has loaded. You can see just the, the data that I got here. Um, and if you kind of go through this endless list, you can see regions that currently exist, that no longer exist, um, and see various information. Uh, and then there's also the grid survey API, uh, which has various information. Uh, so, and again, as I just mentioned, in addition to the privately owned uh, island regions and estates, they, they're called island just because they're sort of separate from, you know, out in the grid somewhere, and I'll s show you a map soon. Um, there are also several contiguous land masses, which are, you know, thousands of regions in total, 
There's one that's 433 regions, another that's like almost 1,000, uh, and they kind of vary uh, in that um, sort of range. Um, and they're what's known as mainland or the mainland continents, and that's kind of where I started the focus of my project for uh, the terrain models. Um, and again, mainland is, is a special case in the sense that uh, even if no one else pays for that region, it'll still be there. It's part of that landmass. It'll continue to exist. Uh, and the way that Linden Lab actually sort of maintains or pays for the upkeep of these regions is that they will lease individual uh, parcels, kind of, you know, land within these regions to regular residents that can do different things with them. Uh, and again, these land masses are known as mainland. There are about 10, I would say, official mainland continents. And then um, there's Belisari and the Linden Homes, which is the largest continent but it's kind of a special case because that's one of those areas where I said it's developed by the moles, the independent contractors, as a benefit for uh, premium subscribers. Second Life is completely free to use, but if you pay a premium membership, one of the benefits is that you get a free Linden home in one of these uh, regions, which I'll show you in just a second. Uh, this is, again, I'm not the only one who's apparently obsessed with uh, this world. This is uh, another resident-run project, the Second Life Geography Institute, um, that has a list of some of the mainland continents here. Um, there's a ton of information about uh, this, but so this is a list of continents. Not all of these are actually mainland. Like I said, Belisari is kind of a special case. The Blake Sea is an open ocean area, not really a continent. Um, and these older premium east, south, south, south are sort of the older versions of these Linden homes. Um, but it's still kind of interesting. And then you can see here, this is on the, um, the Second Life official wiki. That's uh, one of the senior VPs of, of Linden Lab going for a skate ride. Um, but so this is basically a wiki page about all these different themes. Um, and as I mentioned, Belisari, which is currently about 2,500 regions, so it's quite a lot, um, has these different themed neighborhoods with like hundreds of houses each um, in these different themes. And as a premium member, you sort of get, um, you know, you can get a home in one of these neighborhoods and kind of do whatever you want with them. So there's, I think, about 12 themes currently. Um, but you can just kind of, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but it's, it's interesting. And I will say that uh, one of the recent updates, some of these might look a little dated. Some of them look nicer than others. Um, the lab actually just, uh, who, is here, who here is familiar with PBR, physically based rendering? So uh, a few of you, it's basically a new way to uh, do 3D graphics that's a little bit closer to how things are actually rendered in, or look in real life. Uh, using like the properties of a material to be like if it's metallic, how rough it is. So they're actually, um, they've just done that and there'll be real mirrors and reflection probes and things like that kind of beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but again, you know, kind of looks nice. So, and then one of the um, continent size models that I actually did last year, I started off with smaller regions. Um, and then this is actually uh, one of those mainland continents that I mentioned, Hatteraser, which is 433 regions. So this is kind of how it looks on the world map, 2D. And then this is all made in Blender, rendered in Blender. And you get farther down and then suddenly see, ooh, you can, it pops out and you can see that this is um, sort of what it would look like. Again, the objects that are on the world map are sort of shown there. And now it's just the uh, you know, solid rendering mode in Blender. Um, but uh, this is how the terrain would look if you could see the entire thing at once at least. And so I just did a, a loop around it. This is also called the Atoll continent. Kind of, you can probably tell why. Um, but so this is the first continent-sized um, model that I made sometime last year. And I think, if I remember correctly, um, this particular model um, in Blender at the original level of detail uh, with the, the data that I got from Second Life to do this would have been 227 million triangles. Uh, my laptop would have exploded <laughs> if I tried to render the video with that, uh, but I decimated each region's mesh uh, so that it's only 2.3, only 2.3 million triangles instead. Um, and I've actually, I'll talk a little bit more about the process involved in getting this data and using it, but uh, when I did this uh, last year and gathered the height data across all these 433 different regions, um, it took about 32 hours um, to get the data for all 433 regions. Now it takes much less time, luckily, because I changed um, how I gathered the data a little bit. So, um, And then I do want to show just before uh, I move on, um, of course it would ask me for this. Uh, sorry, one second, as everything has to be secure these days, which is good, of course. Uh, 
Um, you might have seen in the uh, Perspective in Place video, the video essay that I showed, um, that there was sort of a math museum. It's called the New Kadath Lighthouse Art Gallery. Um, I don't know how good the internet is in here, so it might take some things a while to load. Uh, but um, as you maybe saw in the video, uh, there's this place, which is a long-running gallery. Again, everything that's gray is basically loading in. Everything's online. Uh, textures sort of download on the fly. Um, so you can kind of see, this is that map. You can see someone made, the, um, there are train stations and railways, so someone did sort of a live updating uh, map of certain little automated cars there, or train cars um, on that map. And then you can see this is the New Kadath Lighthouse Art Gallery with lots and lots and lots of maps of various parts of Second Life, uh, the mainland continents, along with other places. Uh, and this is quite interesting. This is from 2002. It's in the shape of a key. The original 16 Second Life regions um, as they existed back then. And then over time, more and more regions were added to the point where uh, it became, uh, whoops, sorry. Someone just messaged me. I'm going to put myself on unavailable. I can't log in without someone. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Um, but yeah, so, and then uh, you can kind of see over here, some of the, this is some of the uh, Bellis area as it's grown. Um, and oh, thank you very much. Um, I was gonna actually ask if you could, guys could see, and that probably helps quite a bit. Um, so you can see some of the mainland continent collections, or map collections, um, magic map where you can see uh, any particular region. Um, and then, um, I was going to show on the world map, you can kind of see also. Um, so this is a live updating world map, which again, because it's live, sometimes takes a while to load. Um, but so th this continent that you see here, which has a sort of an odd shape um, from like up here to like down here is uh, Bellis area that Linden home with all the different themes. The, um, you know, premium member uh, neighborhoods, as you can tell. And this is the original continent, Sansara. And then you can see Heterostra, and there's others over uh, up here. So there's supercontinents. And then if you zoom all the way out, um, I don't know how well that's going to load, but there's, like I said, almost 28,000 regions. Most of them are sort of off by themselves, either as individual regions or uh, forming uh, contiguous land masses, much smaller than the mainland, of course, but still maybe someone owns it and wants to make a private estate for whatever reason, whether it's a school or some other um, organization or just an individual with a few pockets. Um, but so you can kind of see, get a sense at least of uh, the scale. But the question is, why did I actually start making these terrain models? And as you might be able to gather, there's a lot of landmass in Second Life and the viewer software um, akin to a browser basically, but it's what you use to you know, be in Second Life. They're very, um, the viewer code itself is open source, luckily. Um, they open sourced it some years ago, so there's the official viewer from Linden Lab and then various third-party viewers um, that have different features and different UIs, so, um, and is available for Linux as well, which is a good thing for me since uh, I'm a long-time Linux user. But uh, regardless of which viewer you use, you can only render a small chunk of the world at a time. You can't see like that entire continent at once. Um, I think the, uh, it might be different on certain viewers, but you can change your draw distance uh, from like 32 meters away from your camera position up to 1024. Uh, for anyone, you know, developers, you'll be familiar with powers of two, and you'll see that a lot in Second Life in, in various areas. Um, like every parcel, individual parcel in a region is like a maximum of, of 16 square meters, or minimum rather, I should say, and it goes up from there. So, um, But anyway, so you can only see a few regions ahead of you, maybe three or four if you're lucky, depending on your GPU. It's a huge world, it's extremely diverse, um, and I, I wanted to basically for myself and for other people, both people in Second Life and who have never been there, uh, give a different perspective in the world and be able to see more of the world or more of its land masses at least, the terrain, uh, than you're ordinarily able to do. Um, also, I like to tinker and explore different things through sort of project-based learning. Um, so Blender's fun, Python is fun, put them together and try using the Blender Python API, and sometimes it's not so fun, because um, there's a lot of testing, a lot of debugging, um, and I'm, I'm still somewhat skeptical of ChatGPT and other things, and of course I started this before sort of the AI wave really took off. Um, so all of this is basically just me digging into the code, looking at Stack Overflow, which of course now is probably overrun by AI anyway, but um, 
but yeah, it's it's been a very interesting project. Uh, how am I doing with time? Okay, I have a lot of time. Um, and so the process uh, actually involved in this, it's a multi-step process. Um, there is a built-in scripting language in Second Life called LSL or Linden scripting language. Um, and you know you can give put a script or multiple scripts into any particular object and do lots of different things with it. Um, and so one of the functions, and you'll hear see here on the, um, let's close a few of these. Um, this is the LSL portal, uh, which is sort of on the official Second Life wiki, um, showing um, it's kind of a, a seed-like language, I would say. Uh, but so it has lots of different functions, lots of things you can do related to, you know, camera movement, collisions, um, you know, different math, you know, physics, all of these things. People make all kinds of vehicles in SL. But one of the functions that I, again, use for this, uh, the main function, is this function called LL ground. Uh, which basically tells you the height, the terrain height of any particular point in a region. Uh, you might notice here it says offset. Um, there are some functions that get like partial details or details about the region where you can actually say the coordinates. Again, the coordinates are 0 to 256 on the x, 0 to 256 on the y. Um, unfortunately, LL ground is a little bit different. It takes the height below the scripted object or if you're wearing that scripted object below your avatar. So um, one of the kind of challenges I encountered was basically having to constantly check, okay, where am I or where's this object as I'm getting the height so that if I move a little bit, uh, you know, I try to kind of keep myself relatively still, but, you know, you're constantly checking the position. But so what I did with this function uh, is I loop across a region and I have a Python script on my computer. Um, everything, by the way, uh, another kind of little function here. Uh, HTTP response, anything, any object in Second Life can be uh, simultaneously or either or uh, or both uh, HTTP server or client um, with certain limitations, of course. But so um, the way I actually gather the data in the first place is to have a Python script that communicates with a scripted object in SL um, and basically tells it, I want data from this row, this X value. And then the script in SL will say, okay, it'll loop across an entire uh, row of X, uh, or I should say, yeah, um, the Y coordinate is what is sent in, and then it goes every half a meter across the region at that particular Y coordinate, every half a meter in the X uh, axis, basically, and gets the height and then feeds that data via HTTP to my, uh, my computer. Um, it's just a bunch of float values. Um, I can show you here what it looks like. This is a particular region called Cormac. Um, so this is uh, 513 lines of just tons and tons of float values, again, every half a meter, getting the, the height at that particular point, and then some uh, sort of preliminary data about that region that helps me when I want to reposition them in Blender or in World. Um, so, oh, did I just do that? Uh, so there's a lot. But, um, and so that was a challenge, of course, in itself to try to figure out how much data can I actually send by HTTP to my computer from a cell on every pass through. Um, and when I said that it took 32 hours to gather the data for Heterostra last year, um, I had one scripted object that was just doing this. Now I have, I think, uh, one object that has um, what's called a link set. When you have multiple objects linked together, each of them can have a script. So now I actually have it in parallel. So the Python script is sort of doing, um, I don't, who here is familiar with Python, by the way? Or Okay, quite a few. Do you know async or async IO? There's that, and I think I actually looked at that, and I wound up doing, I think, in uh, a threaded version instead um, that basically is able to, I think, in like seven or eight um, threads, get data from different rows, uh, which saves a lot of time uh, by being able to communicate with multiple objects in Second Life and not rely on that one HTTP connection, which is sort of a bottleneck. Um, after that, uh, I can make a list that uh, of, of different regions that I want to gather data for. Um, that and then the script can actually, the script on my computer can look at this um, list and then communicate with the script in a cell and say, okay, I've gotten all the data, go to this region at this set of coordinates. And then the script in a cell will teleport me automatically. Usually it runs pretty smoothly. Occasionally it'll get teleport fails in Second Life and then I have to not restart the process, but restart from where it left off or where the teleport failed. Uh, but usually it works pretty well. Um, you can also download the, those map textures that you saw in World, um, thanks to Taiki Shepard's grid survey, and there's some other people who have this. 
every texture, every image, most every object actually in Second Life has a UUID, a universal unique identifier, um, and sort of the textures. So these are all sort of publicly available um, and Titan has the UUIDs for these map tiles on her site. Um, so I download them, generate region models using Blender's Python API, apply the textures. Part of the script can also decimate and reduce the, the complexity. Like I said, it was like down from 226 million triangles to however much I said, um, and then uh, export them as mesh objects, as Collada files that you can then up, uh, upload to SL. Uh, and then I have another LSL script that can reposition these uh, and apply textures to the wa uh, terrain and the water, which is a separate, um, it's called face in Second Life, but it's basically a different material uh, for the water height uh, and profit. Not really, I haven't made any money off this, but it's a passion project for now. So uh, maybe at some point. How am I doing? Okay. Um, so um, what I'm actually gonna do now, just since you've seen a little bit about the process that uh, is involved uh, and what I've done, um, hopefully no one's gonna come in here and wonder what this person's standing in the middle of the floor. So I'll just put myself in AFK mode um, while I'm out of the way. Uh, so I'll do a little demo of Blender and then I'll show a few more things. And if you have any questions, I'll do Q and A toward the end, but also feel free to stop me at any point um, if you have questions about anything uh, and I do not have Blender open yet. Okay, so one second. So here is the Blender interface. It's amazing. And what people usually do is they open Blender and then they delete the poor default cube. Um, poor little cube. Um, but so if ha has anyone here actually tried using Blender's Python API? Not really, okay. Good, that's, I mean, you know, ho hopefully this inspires you to do something with it, anything. I find Blender, um, there's a guy who some of you might know named Andrew Price or Blender Guru. Um, I've, he's like talked about how with Blender, there's a lot of complexity, there's a lot in the software, but he uses what he calls the 80-20 rule that I think, uh, let's see if I say this right, that he uses 20% of Blender's features 80% of the time. So again, even though Blender is extremely complex, you're not gonna use all of it. I mean, for most projects, you'll use a tiny portion. A big part of the learning curve is just getting some of the shortcuts into your brain, uh, and I'll talk about that too. Uh, but so, if you have not used Blender's Python API, you can see up here on the right, I hope that's uh, maybe a little hard to see. Well, up here, um, there's something called scripting tab in the default sort of layout, and you click here, and then here's your text editor, another view, uh, viewer area, uh, and then here's the Blender Python console. And this is extremely useful for getting started with Blender's Python API. I'm just gonna maximize that. Uh, and then you can zoom with the control wheel so that's a little bit easier to see. Um, but so this is where you can test out things, um, see if they work, see what you need to put in for commands, and then you can kind of write them down in the text editor and, and kind of run them. So one of the things I'm gonna do right now just to kind of show you what you can do, um, even if it's, it is pretty simple, I'm gonna delete everything. So I'm gonna create, let's say, a basic text object. Now, I don't wanna have to go into edit mode and actually, you know, say something there. I just wanna be able to change it. And maybe I have a script, maybe I have a text file of, of strings or something that I wanna use. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it like that. Um, and what you can actually go and do um, this, this is where sort of the learning curve for Blender's Python API gets involved because um, everything in Blender is basically on the back end, this, this hierarchical series of data blocks. Um, so there's a lot of like dots involved. So for this, if I type this open, so, oops, that's the wrong, the, the focus follows mouse gets a little bit uh, tricky sometimes, but so bpy.data.objects that's sort of the hierarchy under which the objects live. And then if I hit tab, you'll see there's only one object in the scene right now, it's text. And so let's say I wanna actually change the string, the, the actual text that's showing. Then there's another dot and another data. Again, things get somewhat long here sometimes. And then body. That's currently the, so if I hit equals, uh, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, and let's say, um, this is only a test. And of course I hit, I forgot, ah forgot the quote, um, and look, it's been changed just like that. Uh, another thing that you can do is actually change uh, in, a, oops, um, in addition to that, you can also change something, uh, data, 
dot extrude. Let's say right now it's uh, zero. There's no extrusion. It's a very, it's like it has no volume to it. Let's make that one. Oops. Uh, and then suddenly you have something that's actually quite large. Um, and then if we delete that, then uh, one of the other thing, oh, actually, let's not delete that for a second. Um, and you can go to this mouse movement is not helpful. Um, you can actually go to the location of it. So like if we go, and let's say it's not data now, now it's just the object itself because we're not looking at the data of the text object, we're looking at the object itself um, and see where its location is. Okay, that's, you know, it's kind of at the origin. Let's change it to one, zero, two. And now it's been moved up around a little bit. Now the other thing that you can do, of course, and this is sort of where um, I'm getting into sort of the, the, uh, the way that you can make it easier on yourself, how to find things, is if you go, let's go to the main screen here. If you go to preferences in, uh, in the interface tab, I'm sorry, this isn't bigger, but uh, on the interface tab in Blender as preferences, there's a check mark here, I already had it checked, but it's called Python tooltips. If you can't see that, it's right there. Um, Python tooltips. And now what happens is if you hold, let's uh, actually bring that back, text. If you hold your mouse, let's say over here in the properties thing, and you hold it over, let's say, location X, then you're going to see it says, this is really, can is that really blurry? I get, yeah, well, I'll, I'll read what it says. So it says lo uh, location, uh, location uh, of the object, and then ordinarily what you don't see, but what is now there since I enabled that checkbox, it says python object.location, and then it'll say bpy.data.objects.text.location0 because it's the, the x coordinate. What you can actually do there, because you don't want to have to remember that, you just right click on it and then hit copy full data path. If you do data path, it's just going to say location, but you can either do shift control alt C, again, these like massive shortcuts, but uh, or just right click. And then now if you go to scripting and you hit, then you've gotten that and that's the X coordinate uh, for that. So you can do that with pretty much any, oops, sorry, um, any property like that or anything. And if it's a menu or let's say uh, we wanted to add, let's say that we wanted to add a new text object, um, usually would go out there up to add text or shift A for the same menu and text. And again, if you hold your mouse over that, then there's a B, uh, Blender Python operator called bpy.offs.object.textAd. Again, we don't want to have to remember that. If you right click, there's no copy, but you can, so it's a little different when it's a menu item. Here, you can just hold your mouse over it and hit control C, and then you go to the this, and now text add. And now if we, and we've added a new one, and you can actually do, if you actually remove the parentheses, the ending parentheses on that, and hit tab, it'll give you some parameters that you can actually use. So like the radius, lo initial location, alignment, rotation, you know, and you can do this pretty much on any function. Just remove the last parentheses, hit tab, it'll kind of auto-complete the other things that are usually optional, but that you can actually um, specify if you want. Um, so that's a simple text object. Now, find my presentation. Um, so the parameters. Uh, one other thing besides enabling Python tooltips that's extremely useful in Blender is if you the menu search, which is either up here in edit and menu search. And then you can see here, or not really, uh, but it's F3. So if you had F3 pretty much anywhere here, then you can actually search for what you need to, to use. And the nice thing about Blender's menu search is you can actually type in the shortcut itself. You don't have to know, if you, let's say, remember a shortcut, but you don't know what it does. Let's say I had F th F3. It'll say, oh, edit menu search. So it actually knows the shortcuts. You can search by shortcut or by uh, the menu item uh, and find things that way. Um, and you can even, in this menu search, hold your mouse over it to, again, see sort of the Blender, the, the Python API, sort of command that you would use for it, uh, which is extremely cool. And then again, control C to do that. Um, one of the things just uh, to be aware of actually is, let's say we go back to this, uh, the default cube. And let's say I wanted to change one of the vertices. So I'm actually gonna, I don't need the text editor. Um, so let's say I wanted to change, this is, um, now there's several objects because I used the default one, but so it's the cube. Um, if you're gonna change the vertex, there's a difference in Blender between the, an object and the mesh. The mesh is the data, is data that sort of lives underneath the object. So if I did 
this sort of cube object and then dot data and hit enter, you'll see that its data is something called bpy.data.meshes cube, which in this case, the mesh has the same name as the cube. That's just by default, but you can change the, um, you can change it so up in the right side, if you hit the little arrow, you'll see that underneath the cube is a mesh called cube, but we could actually hit that and F2 and change it to whatever we want. Below the mesh is a material that's assigned to that. So there's all sorts of data under the hood that you can find in Blender. It's just a matter of knowing where to look. But so in this case, if I wanted to change the, let's say one of the, um, ah, sorry, the, uh, if I wanted to change, let's say the mesh data of this cube, we can hit vertices, um, and then li it's a list, so you would take, let's say, zero, and then say that we want to change the coordinates. Uh, it's dot co for coordinate. Um, and then we want to change that to, let's say, five, two, three, and then see what happens. And that's kind of interesting. Now, the thing is, though, if we, if we do that while in edit mode, nothing's going to happen. So that's one of the kind of gotchas with Blender is, you know, besides finding the hierarchy, um, if you're going to change things about a mesh, you have to make sure you're in object mode. So if I try to now change that, again, I'm changing one of the vertices to five, two, three, hit enter, nothing happens. And if I tab back out into object mode, nothing actually changed. So if I go now, let's say again, says it's one, one, zero, I try again and change, oops, sorry change it to 523. If I hit that, it'll, it'll change it, but it won't actually apply. So if you get the coordinates for that vector, um, it'll say the new updated version, but then as soon as you go back into object mode and try that again, it's back to 111. So when you're changing vertices um, or anything about a mesh, that's something to be aware of. Um, one of the other things actually to be aware of uh, with Blender uh, and that comes into play a lot with um, Blender's Python API, is there's a difference between selected object or objects and the active object. As far as I know, there's always only one active object, but you could have multiple objects selected. And just because an object is selected doesn't mean it's active. Just because an object is active doesn't mean it's selected. So these are one of the, the weird little gotchas. So like, this is a command that you would type in uh, in Blender's Python API, like you, you the view layer in the context um, again, this will all be sort of on the YouTube, um, the, the video hopefully later, and if anyone wants these slides or this, this text file actually, uh, let me know after and I can send this to you. But so um, that's how you would s change the, um, the active object by hitting equals, and you can't just put the name of the object, you have to actually give it. So like, let's say I want to, now, now the light is the active object because it's that kind of deep orange um, over here. But if I want to make the cube the active object, then I have to go, like I said, uh, the context view layer um, dot active. Oops. Uh, oh, no, objects dot active again. Uh, easy to get lost in here. And if I just do cube, it's going to say expected an object type, not a string. So you have to actually give it the data path to that particular object, which in this case was bpy.data.objects um, cube. And then if I hit enter, it's hard to tell, but in the, in the properties window up here, it is now the active object. So that is something to kind of be aware of. Um, also, there's another thing in preferences, which is quite useful. If you want to actually see, like if you're trying to change a particular vertex in Blender and you want to specify, you know, you want to know, let's say, um, you know, this vertex right here, what, what, how would I access that? What number in that sort of vertex uh, list would this be? There's another option in preferences um, kind of above in interface, above Python tooltips. I wish this were clear, um, but it's called developer extras. And then if you have that checked and then you go into edit mode and then up here, <laughs> which is again, is extremely hard to see. I'm sorry, but uh, this will be on the video. It's called mesh edit overlays. And there's now a little thing that says developer and a checkbox that says indices. And if you have that enabled, it's a little hard to see. It's easier on my screen. I think there's a setting somewhere to change the font. Um, but I don't know where. Uh, but now, if you actually look at it, at least on my screen, you see that vertex is number six. Uh, you know, it goes, starts counting from zero, um, zero to eight on this. So you can see that. And again, if we actually, let's say we created a mesh grid, um, where's the grid? Uh, 
that might be a little easier to see. You can kind of see at least there's like a little blue number hovering above each vertex saying how you would access that particular vertex uh, using uh, Blender's Python API. So uh, a couple of other things to be aware of. Um, as you might have noticed, my mouse keeps sliding. Um, so in Blender, everything, I don't know if there's a way to change this, maybe in the underlying code if you rebuild it, um, uh, everything sort of follows mouse. So like when I was trying to change something in the console, my mouse kind of scrolled down to this like message area, or if I want to do something that requires me to like have focus on the, the, the kind of the view mode here, the, the uh, what do they call it, the three viewport, um, you just kind of have to make sure that your mouse is where you need it to be. That's a big, big gotcha and something I've encountered a lot. Um, there's also some cool uh, console and editor shortcuts. Uh, as you might have seen, if I do control and then mouse wheel, you can kind of zoom if you want to see um, higher. And there's also some shortcuts uh, available in the menu uh, for deleting the line, clearing everything, going backwards in the history. Uh, so that's extremely useful. Uh, one of the things to notice is when you have the text editor, let's say I make a new um, you know, thing here, uh, which I can also make bigger. If you're testing scripts in the Blender console over here, you do not have to import the BPy or Blender Python module. If you're writing a script in the text editor, you do. This is sort of built in. Um, if we restarted Blender, it would say sort of at the top that certain modules are already sort of pre-imported. But if you're going to do something uh, in the text editor or want something you want to save and run a script for later, you have to import BPy um, and any other modules that you might need. Um, and one other thing to note, you can actually see like if you were to use um, like print statements in Python, either in the console or the text editor, you might wonder where those go. Like, are, are they going to show up here in the console? They do not. Um, on Mac and Linux, running Blender, you have to run it from the terminal, and then anything that you kind of get sent, either to error or you know other sort of print messages and things like that, will get sent to the terminal. On Windows, I think there is an option somewhere in the menu to sort of have this kind of console or extra console show up. Um, but again, if you're going to sort of, if you want to print things or you want to have uh, information, then, you know, start Blender from the terminal and then you can kind of see like certain, th it'll, it's reading the preferences. We can say print, um, hello scale. It'll print it there. Oh, I might be wrong. Oh no, okay. it's. It will show up there if you're printing something like that, but if you're doing it from a text editor, uh, from like a pre-written script, it won't show up in the console, but it will show up here in the terminal. So uh, that's why, and then I should probably close Blender the right way, but I didn't. Um, so I don't have too much time, but I will just uh, go, um, any questions so far? Okay, so I just have a couple slides left. So um, I'm still here, and there's me coming back from AFK mode. Um, so, as I mentioned, Heterostra was the video I made last year. This is um, Belisari, that Linden Homes continent, which as of January um, 20th had 2,541 regions, extremely large. Uh, now it has more because they're adding to some of the themes. Um, this only took 18 hours to gather the data. It still seems like a lot, but when you consider that the Heterostra continent, which is about a fifth of the size, took 32 hours, this is a big difference. Um, also changed how it generates. This would have been 1.3 billion triangles at the highest resolution. Now it's only 13 million. I recently upgraded my laptop's RAM to 32 gigs of RAM before I was at eight. Um, so this is basically just another little camera movement. This is in Blender uh, or rendered uh, through Blender, but you can kind of see some of these areas are maybe not as easy to tell that it's actually a landmass and, and has topography unless you're up close or below, but you can kind of see in the distance some of these mountainous areas. Uh, that's a log home theme. Again, you can kind of tell I've been in Second Life way too long. Um, I know way too much about the world itself and the people and things you can do, but there's a lot you can do with it, and I think it is actually very cool for tinkerers. Like, historically, that was kind of Second Life's claim to fame that it was live, you could build in real time, script, do various things, have people see in real time what you're making. Um, it is uh, a, a cool world to develop in actually in different ways. So that's uh, that video. And then I will actually show, so this is a sort of smaller, like the way I actually did things before when I generated the models is I would actually use those numbers and those data files you saw 
to build a mesh vertex by vertex by vertex, adding it to a list, connecting faces manually between those vertices, and then there's a command in Blender's Python API called from pi data, which can generate meshes. That is one way to go for a lot of projects. It's a lot slower, I realize, so now what I actually have is I pre-created this sort of grid mesh that has 263,000 169 vertices, I think. Uh, so it's 513, 513. Um, and so basically now, instead of creating a mesh vertex by vertex, I'll just duplicate this mesh and then have the, the Python script take the data in those text files and change the Z coordinate of those vertices much, much faster, much easier. Um, I don't know why I did that, do that last year, but again, it's a learning experience. Uh, and so this is the wastelands, this is, I'm guessing, the oh no, the material showed up, okay. Um, so this is a small private, like post-apocalyptic themed estate. You can kind of see like uh, the flat part is um, sort of the water face, which is an extra set of four vertices, just a simple plane. Um, and one of the neat things, so I won't actually, it takes a little bit of time, so I won't show it generating them because there's nothing really to see, but, um, then and then there's also, um, I'll just open the, so this is actually the script that generates th that, so, you know, picks where the files are, imports these things, uh, gets the coordinates for the region so it can figure out where to put these. There, Each region is an individual mesh object, so it um, positions them according to that, um, tells me how much time it took, um, and you can see here that sort of object active uh, in order to decimate. So like modifiers work on the active object. If you're adding a modifier or changing it, you have to be the active object. Um, but certain, like for example, you know, if you're going to duplicate something, it's the selected object or objects. So that's one of those things where it gets a little bit confusing, uh, and you have to be aware of what you're actually doing, selected versus active. So, uh, but that is what that script ran, created this. Then there's a one to uh, texture the models, um, which is sort of uh, this. And again, if you have any questions about anything with this, I know it's a kind of a lot to, to look through, and I'm rapidly running out of time. Uh, but this is to texture the models. Um, and then I'll just show one thing actually live in here. There is a script I made. Um, in Second Life, you can actually see, like if you open the world map, um, you'll see the world map textures, which are sort of the terrain with not all, but some of the objects sort of kind of baked into the texture, uh, as you can see here. And so that's sort of the standard view that people are used to with the map. But um, thanks to Taiki Shepard's grid survey database, uh, you can also get UUIDs for the terrain only or terrain layer textures. So if I open uh, this texture change, I think that's correct. Uh, you can kind of see here. So I just very simple imported BPI um, for image. This is sort of the, the data path where the images are stored, including textures. Um, you know, I've just replaced something. This is all sort of here. Uh, I have in that folder, I have the terrain layer textures, the terrain only, and world map. So if I run this, either this little play button or just Alt P, then suddenly this is showing the terrain, but no objects. Um, so, you know, you can, you can do a lot on the fly with that. Uh, let me see, where am I in terms of time? I already showed that. Oh, and so there's actually, uh, right now, it's kind of interesting. I had two conferences at once because there is something called the Virtual World's Best Practices in Education Conference, uh, which is going on this weekend as well. Um, I'm not presenting, but I do have an exhibit. So this is, I believe, the 16th annual or 17th annual, maybe. Um, and so in addition to the various presenters, it's basically different professors, educators who use uh, virtual worlds, not just Second Life, but any kind of uh, virtual world platform, including social media, to teach um, and do various projects. So in addition to the presenters, there's different panel discussions, posters, and then also uh, various exhibits uh, set in this kind of biome theme. So uh, I actually have this very simple little uh, exhibit, which you can see here um, as part of this. You can see, I don't know if anyone else is here. Um, it's so this is the conference area that's... Uh, one, two, three, well, a few, a few regions. Um, and so this sort of biome area, this is uh, the parcel uh, that I made an exhibit on. You can see my avatar in this. And so these are sort of examples of imported. So like you can see here, this is with the object layer or the uh, shown the terrain layer. And so the I have not yet imported um, or uploaded mesh of these continent size models because that would take 
a long time and you have to pay to upload mesh. Um, so that would both be expensive and time consuming, but I will at some point. These are the original 16 second life regions I mentioned that existed back in 2003. Um, so, you know, this is just a little exhibit for people who happen to uh, walk by um, and see the different exhibits. Um, and then also one other thing, uh, you might notice that this um, this vehicle sandbox area, which is on the original continent Sensora, can also be <laughs> made extremely big um, or larger. I could have actually made this larger, but everything in Second Life has land impact, which is kind of how they calculate resources in terms of like land is has a particular amount of objects. Like if I look at this parcel that I own, which is Fairly sizable, actually. I've, I've accumulated some land here over the past couple of years. Uh, this ca the capacity of this parcel is um, 9,283. That is not objects. That's land impact. More complicated objects in terms of the number of triangles or textures or if they're in physics enabled will have a higher land impact. Um, and so this particular model, this link set, which is this group of models, is currently a land impact of 1,578. I think it was only like... Um, Oh, I can actually check. It was uh, scaled down. It was how much? <laughs> 23 land impacts. So you can see that going from 23 up to like 1,500, when you make objects bigger, it's basically because uh, in terms of draw distance and where people are rendering from, it, it has a, it's more taxing on people's GPUs because they'll see it from farther away. The bigger an object, the farther away you can see it in higher detail. So that's why they raise the land impact to try to kind of... Um, do that. And there's no physics on it in right now. I just have a, a invisible uh, platform underneath it so I can walk around on it, but I could walk through the mountains or do whatever I want, which is kind of cool. I had uh, a friend of mine uh, put a little uh, Godzilla avatar and walk around on here, which is kind of interesting, um, I believe. Oh, so yeah, and the future improvements you can see down here. I want to optimize the scripts a little bit further. Uh, also in Blender, you can also with Python see the coordinates for the bounding box of any object. So one of my plans is to actually use that in order to automatically generate this kind of little display cases that exactly fit sort of the height and, and um, you know, uh, all of that, the shape of, these are just ones that I've made in Second Life. Uh, you can res things in SL like cube, sphere, different things, and then uh, change their size and shape and things like that. So that's just what I did for these display cases, but I want to do that in Python, um, and there's some other things I want to do to improve the, the process itself. Um, these I know are probably not things you can write down immediately, but like I said, it will be on the, uh, the video live stream, and also if you want, um, I can email you these list of links. These are just links to some of the Blender Python API documentation, uh, some of the things I talk about with the gotchas, tricks, um, you know, some uh, questions about working with mesh. There is a module that's actually separate from BPy, for working with mesh more directly. It's sort of how Blender handles mesh internally, and that's called B-Mesh. Um, I haven't gotten into that as much. Uh, it might actually be something I want to explore further, but it basically gives access to m uh, Blender's internal mesh ed editing API. There are certain functions that you can use there that you can't do, things you can do with that that you can't do with BPy. Um, but again, I haven't uh, dived into that as much. Um, and then some things, uh, you know, if you want to check if an object exists, just some uh, stack exchange or over stack overflow, th um, things that have been helpful to me. Uh, and of course, Andrew Price, Blender Guru, his famous or infamous donut tutorial, uh, updated for Blender 4.0, some Blender traps, a video that's useful, um, and then some other um, Blender docs about, um, you know, the data blocks and the hierarchy. And as I mentioned, the command line is some things you can see in Windows. I believe there is, um, oh yeah, window toggle system console, but in Mac and Linux, like I said, to see the output of the text editor, um, you have to run it from the terminal. And then this is actually, for some of you might know this if you're familiar with Python already, this is actually one of my favorite sites for learning Python, um, realpython.com. I'm not being paid by them, I wish. Um, but they have a lot of really well-written articles, and especially these days, sometimes it's hard to find articles that weren't written by an AI um, and have like a bunch of SEO cruft. Um, but so this is actually all curated, written by humans, maybe with a little help from AI, who knows. But um, yeah, real Python is, is really useful for, um, you know, Python of any kind. Um, and I 
think that is actually it. So I have about 10 minutes, or if you want to stay later, uh, for questions or comments or suggestions or complaints. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Any, any questions about Second Life, Blender, Python, the meaning of life? So you said, um, show of hands again, uh, a lot of people were familiar with Python. Who had actually tried Blender's Python API? A little bit, okay, so most of you hadn't. So, I mean, hopefully you can kind of see that there, you know, you can start off small, or you can just work like with individual objects, like, you know, a text object, let's say, and just sort of experiment and, and get going. Um, there's a lot you can do with it, and like I said, I think that for me, I never would have, like this was, this project had nothing to do with my school work. Like I was, I had already started this before I got into this media arts and technology program at UC Santa Barbara. This was just my love of Second Life, of places, of geography, even virtual geography. So if you find something that, you know, you want to do, something you love, could be anything that, you know, maybe involves Python and Blender, something you want to do in 3D, um, you know, just dive in, get started, and um, like I said, there, there, there is that learning curve, but there's a lot of ways to find your way in, and hopefully this sort of um, helps with that, to, you know, so inspire you guys to experiment. Um, any questions? Yes. Uh, I have, I don't know where on my hard drive or solid state drive they are right now because my, my file system is very unorganized. <laughs> um, my inventory and in Second Life, everyone has an inventory of objects. Mine is also very unorganized. I don't know what that says about me. Um, but I have actually, yeah, I've done, um, uh, I've done some sort of, n not like is involved in this, but it's, uh, it's kind of fun to play around with and do different, um, I'm trying to remember where they are now. Every, I usually use my desktop as like a working space, and then when it sort of starts to fill up visually, I'll just be like, oh, let's create a new folder called desktop files, <laughs> January 2024, and like shove them in there, and then shove them in my home like folder. And then I'm like, oh, when did, when did I work on that? Is it, you know, was it last year? Was it like, which, you know, which month? And then I'm like digging through, so I really need to organize it. Um, but yeah, and there, there's a lot of, um, just even just playing with modifiers, like even just picking the cube object, adding you know, various modifiers to it, playing with the, the cloth modifier and cloth physics in Blender, doing different things. Like there's a lot of really um, fun time wasty things to do in Blender that eventually sometimes you know, you're like, oh, this is actually kind of cool. You're just playing around. You're like, oh, maybe I'll save this and save it as a render or whatever and, and use it as visual art. So yeah, it's, um, I have, but I wish I could show it if I could find it. Um, any other, yes? <laughs> that is a very, very good question. Um, I'm not sure, <laughs> actually. Let me see. Um, I mean, Andrew Price, like, again, you, it, he's not changing Blender itself to be simpler, but um, it's, like, his tutorials are really good, and he is talking about the shortcuts. He, he goes into things at a fairly basic level. Um, Yes, the rest of the UI is still there. Um, but I mean, th there are, you can customize Blender's UI and like actually remove tabs and like um, change sort of the default. Actually, if I go into it, there's something called, um, if you go up to file, I think it's in file, uh, defaults, save startup file. So, and then load factory settings is there too. So if, let's say I didn't wanna have Blender create the sort of default lighting camera cube setup, I could delete that and I'm not going to now, but let's say this is how I want it to look when I start up Blender. Then I can go file, defaults, save startup file. And there's also a little Python thing, dpy operator or ops, you know, all that. Um, then the next time you open Blender, that's what it's gonna look like. So you could actually go through and like, you know, let's say delete this tab, the scripting tab. You know, you don't need that, you don't need that, you don't need, uh, you know, all these different tabs. So you can actually do that and then save the startup file. So that kind of helps. Um, kind of a longer process if you kind of do it yourself. There might be people who have like themes like that that you can download, but um, yeah, that, that is uh, one way to make it a little bit less uh, daunting, I guess. Any other questions? Yes.
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, like a displace like a, a displacement texture or image map like that. Yeah, I um there is something in Second Life called a sculpty, which is I forget when they first released it, it was like more than ten years ago. Like initially the way you could build in Second Life was just resing and linking and, and modifying these primitive shapes. Um, you know, spheres, toruses, etc. Um, at one point they added a thing where it's like a very low resolution image that sort of does this displacement math that applies to a prim and then it kind of changes the shape and world, but it's extremely low resolution. I don't know if it's like 64 by 64 max um, in terms of the, the size of it or something like that. Um, the way I actually initially thought of doing terrain models was th there's something on the Second Life Marketplace. Um, I hope this isn't going to give me something adult rated on the first page. Um, yes, it is. Sorry, never mind. I knew I should have. Okay, Sculpt Studio. This is something, um, this is not uh, real money, by the way. I it is real money, but that's not in US dollars. Um, one US dollar is equivalent to about 250 Linden dollars the in world currency, which is a real currency that you can exchange back and forth. So this is um, $20, I something like that. But anyway, so Sculpt Studio, there's a feature to do that kind of thing where you can go to a particular region and say, oh, I want a sculpt map of this, and it'll do that similar process to what I've been doing. But again, it's much lower resolution. Um, and I guess I could have made, there was something cool for me about just having the list of numbers, like the float values. Uh, I'm sure there is a way to, in Python, create like a high resolution texture that would make that a sort of this displacement map. But for me, it's just been easier, I think, to actually modify like the height values directly rather than applying a, um, pl plus actually I think with, with uh, the displacement modifier in Blender, there's sort of that scale. So where like, you know, you say how much it'll affect the object in the mesh. And I think just for my own sake to have it be as precise and as accurate to what you see in world as possible um, is why I wanted to just be able to control the height of the mesh, like precisely have it be exactly the height it was um, in Second Life rather than have to kind of figure out the scaling on the modifier, if that makes sense. No. Yeah, it's, it's literally just like, so for example, uh, yeah, too much is open. Um, so like here, Fort Stygian. So yeah, like these are, so like the, like 67.899, that's in meters. So that would be the lower, le the height of the point at the lower left of that region. And then again, it kind of goes across and then goes up. Um, th there's no scaling applied, it's just, uh, well, um, I see what you mean. When I import them into Second Life, there's another part of the script that will, like, w when I generate the models, it creates a sort of life size, so to speak, or Second Life size, but I do have part of the script that will scale it vastly down. So instead of it being like 256 meters in Blender, it'll scale it down to like half a meter on a side per region so that when I import it into Second Life, you know, it's, it's more like, um, you know, this size. Um, that, yeah, that's scaling the object itself down, um, not necessarily the height or anything, so, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it could be. I mean, like, I, I haven't experimented as much with the displacement modifier. One of the things that would be interesting to try as, as well um, to have other people be able to use this in different ways, I could try to generate, you know, displacement images or maps from the Python script. Um, that might be something to do down the road and see what people do with it. Yeah. That answer your question? Sure does. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Anyone want to tour, since we're here and no one's kicking me out, anyone want a tour of anything in Second Life? Um, if I can find it again. This is the <laughs> first view. Um, yeah, if there are no more questions, I'm, uh, is anyone here about to kick me out? Does anyone here work for the convention? No? Okay. Um, I will actually then take you to one thing which is very cool called Void. They, it's a store, um, sorry, this might be loud. Um, oh. This is a store called Void Inc. Um, and when I first came here, it was a little bit different. Now it's, uh, I'll just fly because it's faster. Um, I'm gonna lower
lower the volume because some of these are a little bit loud. They have something very cool called the Dreamscape simulation engine. I think that's where they... Um, there's also boats down here. If I went um, and, and sat on that, um, it would actually take me across. So yeah, that, that's scripted basically. This is sort of like a collision thing. So it detects that there's an avatar there and then you know moves the vehicle across to the other side. I don't really feel like waiting for it, so I'm just gonna fly over. Um, but so this is, let's see if I can find where they have it. They, they again, they remodeled this. Um, so, oh, Dreamscape. So just to kind of show you what is possible with scripting um, beyond just you know making terrain models, this is, actually I'm gonna make, you can also make the UI disappear, so. Um, so this is, If I get closer to the center, something will happen. Yeah, so it's a little, little sci-fi, cool. Uh, and the re like, it's not doesn't just look cool. This is basically like a hollow deck almost that they've made. Um, so if you click on the center object, um, it would help if I had the UI. Um, then you can spawn a scene of some kind. Let's say I wanted to. I don't know all of them. Oh, Nexus is actually my favorite. So all of this part is, un is unnecessary, but they just wanted to script it to, and I'll go into mouse next so you can see. So basically behind the scenes, it creates this particle effect. Um, it reses a scene around you, which if I were in the center would be more interesting. And so that's, you know, this is something you can actually buy from this store um, and res on your own land. Res basically means to make appear in the world. Um, it's a, a Tron reference, um, I think. Um, and then you see that little thing. So it's, it's basically a scene reser, holodeck type thing. Um, and they have one that's actually called the World Seed, which does the same thing for, um, I'll actually show you that just as the, the last part. The World Seed is basically the Dreamscape simulation engine, but um, at the size of an entire region. You can see this is only one region, 256 meters on a side. The one below it is a ghosted region that doesn't actually exist. There's no name. Um, I don't know why they haven't fixed that yet. Uh, I think it's on the opposite side. Yeah, World Seed. Okay. So this is the same principle as the Dreamscape simulation engine. Um, just a slightly larger scene. And then if I click that, and let's say, um, I don't know which is which here. I, I remember, I've seen some of them, but let's try Aket. Oops. Something should be happening. Egg cracks and then this one takes a little bit longer like it'll actually show in the chat bar it says launching systems and then I think it gives you like a percentage uh. so this is all very unnecessary but it's cool um. so yeah, begin beginning materialization I forget how long this takes but maybe like 10% um. take that long but it does take a couple of minutes I think. 20% okay so it's basically it's at this particular height I think we're currently at uh, 2,400 meters up you can build in any like assuming you have rights on that particular parcel or land you can build up to 4,096 meters in the sky so a lot of people will build like sky boxes you know they might have something at ground level and then do something else in the sky um, the most annoying thing on mainland is when someone has a skybox that's like a 
100 meters up in the sky and you're going by and you can like look, or you're going by on the road and you look up and see all this clutter um, in the air, which is somewhat annoying, but that too is part of Second Life. Uh, but so pr in this particular case, they have the main store at different heights and then they have the world seed at this 2,500 uh, meter elevation so that then when they res out like the entire region scene um, from the world seed, then uh, it's not interfering with anything else at the different levels. So 70%. Anyone have any questions while we wait? Come on, go faster. But yeah, it's basically, like I said, it, it's this object contains, um, or maybe one of the other objects, contains like sort of all of the, the pieces of the scene that it's now resing out around me, which is at my, come on, come on, come on. Um, but so like as it's waiting, it's basically putting everything out there. And then when you end it, um, it'll you know take it all back to the object's inventory. So you as an avatar or as a user or resident have you know an inventory. Um, and objects can have inventories too. And again, inventories in an object can be like you know, the script running or not running if you want a scripted object. 100%, uh, let's see what appears. It might be completely underwhelming. But no, th this is not it. I I'm, waiting for the rest of <laughs> I'm waiting for the rest of the particles to disappear. Oh, there we go. Yay, okay, it was actually kind of cool. Um, and I'm actually gonna change, in, um, in this particular viewer can just type DD for draw distance. Um, so I'm going to make my draw distance up to 300, just so I know that it's resing everything. Uh, but yeah, so this is kind of cool. No particular point to it being here, but again, like people, a lot of people um, like to do photography in Second Life. Uh, Flickr is absolutely sw like swarming with um, like different photographers. Some of them extremely um, talented. Um, a lot of machinima artists or, or videographers doing films. Um, I actually have a friend who um, made a kind of a Blade Runner-esque sci feature-length sci-fi film, two now actually, it has a sequel, um, the past couple of years, um, and then was at film festivals, um, and it's entirely filmed in Second Life. Um, it's, it's impressive, what it took him like 18 months to do the first one, and again, it was all filmed in SL, he had uh, other people being the avatars and doing the voices, and he had written the script. He's also written and published um, like several detective novels set in Second Life that you can find on Amazon. His name his name is Huckleberry Hacks. It's one of those like typical Second Life names. But so um, you know he's an example of someone who might let's say uh, come here and decide oh this would be a great film set. I'm going to use this particular scene for my next movie or you know some other kind of project. And then you could do that. You could go here again. You can kind of um, as you saw in the video essay. I have it actually with me. Um, If anyone's uh, ever seen one of these, like the a space mouse, it used to be called a space navigator. Uh, but this is basically just this little um, six degree of freedom, you know, joystick, which if I plugged it in, uh, maybe I should plug it in actually. Um, come on, okay, I might have to just adjust the preferences. But uh, that is basically one of those things where you can control the camera completely independently of your avatar. I think it's in move and view, it might not be enabled. Um, ah, there we go. 3D connection, space navigator for notebooks. So now, if I use this, um, then here's my avatar, mouse look, whichever. Um, I tap a little shortcut key, and now I can move my camera, and my avatar can be anywhere, doing anything. Um, I can actually do a little, uh, this is a very weird gesture, but bear with me. And if, if you hear, if, if you go closer, you can actually hear, uh, it, it's the most ridiculous thing. P a lot of, I've seen people who communicate through gestures and gestures are basically an object that you can create that can combine um, animations for your avatar, sound um, or uh, text chat will replace what you say and there's that you can assign shortcuts to it. But so while, <laughs> while that's running, I can actually just move the camera around um, and, be, and you can, you can sort of do, Forward and backward, left, right, up, down, um, pitch, yaw. I don't. I don't have roll enabled currently. You can um, deactivate axes, um, but and you can also change the scale uh, value of the movement. So uh, there it keeps going. Um, so like here, you can. It's what's called the fly cam. So if I let's say change that to um, 
30 on the x-axis, 30 there, and 30 on the z, and I'll leave the other ones. Um, then, I don't usually hold it standing up. Um, it was a lot faster. Anyway, so as you can see, this is extremely useful for not only getting a sense of the space you're in, the world, um, getting good shots for photography, but also uh, filming. So. You know, um, there have been experimental, like I said, the, the viewer software is, is open source and there's various third party viewers. I'm on a third party uh, viewer called Firestorm, which is the one that most people use. There was or is, I think, an experimental VR enabled viewer for, Fire, uh, for Firestorm. Um, the good and bad about Second Life is that everything is made by, or most everything is made by individual users many of which do not have the knowledge or skills to optimize things properly, um, which you know is, is not really a judgment, like everyone kind of starts at the level they're at, but because it's sort of this hodgepodge and mishmash of uh, user-made objects, uh, and because of course the rendering engine is like what, 21, 22 years old at this point, um, it, the frame rate, you know, you have to have a good computer and even then sometimes it won't ones run super well, so there's the risk that if you're, you're in VR in Second Life and you're in a very heavy or low frame rate, laggy region, or if there are a lot of avatars. Avatars, the way they're built and like the clothing, clothing and the mesh that people wear, that can be a big thing. So like right now, I'm getting an FPS of 75, which is great. If there were like 10, 20, 30 people in this uh, region, it might drop significantly. So having said that, even if you use the experimental VR viewer, the frame rate you get might not be, uh, you know, you might get nauseous. Um, but but they, are wor they are working on improving things. Like I said, even though this looks fairly impressive, um, I'm the Firestorm version that I have is not PVR enabled. So like I said, now you can do reflection probes, mirrors, uh, physically based rendering like t textures. They're switching from Collada, uh, or you can still do Collada imports, but now they'll be able to do GLTF or the graphics library transmission for ooh, one underneath uh, format to kind of smooth things along. Um, so they are like constantly working on improving it, but, and it, they, I, they're working actually right now on a mobile viewer. So um, I think premium plus subscribers, there's like an alpha or beta version that is available for Android and iOS. And that's something they're hoping will bring in a lot more users. Um, and even just, you know, people who are existing residents being able to go in world when they're out and about and check on things. So. Uh, mobile viewer first, and then maybe you know a couple of years down the road, maybe they'll be able to improve rendering to the point that we can have uh, VR. Uh, in the meantime, VR chat, if anyone's used it, is, is a very cool platform. Has its issues, but it's. Uh, has anyone used VR chat? It. Yeah, I I know. Like it, it removed a lot of the the mods or like the things or, or made it. Um, they do seem like, in fairness, the company behind VRChat to be adding a lot of the things that were sort of disabled by Easy Anti-Cheat, but um, it's a cool platform. But uh, there, I, I, from my own, in my own opinion, I'm not nearly as much in VRChat as I am in Second Life, clearly, but um, I do think that VRChat has incredible potential in what people can make and have made. Uh, and the community there, if you can kind of look past the sort of surface level and sort of the public worlds, there's a lot of really cool things that people have made. So. Um, any other questions? I think, by the way, there's, it's 7.30 right now. There's game night in the expo hall, or the exhibit hall, rather, at 8.30. Or I think it's now for the family game night, and then at 8.30 to 11.30, there's uh, no Second Life, but there will be games, I guess. So any other questions, any last questions before I log out? And Or are you, you all just happy to see me camera around this area? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll put the world seed back to where it was if I can find it so the next person can, uh, I mean, anyone could actually come in here um, and change it back to, oh, there it is, okay. Uh, change it back to how it looked before. Come on. Does it know I'm, oh, there, okay. Remove. Let's see how long it takes to de -res. Oh. That was actually quite, so basically it detected that there was an avatar there and then had a little platform like with the physics and able to push me up. Um, people make elevators in Second Life, like vehicles, like elevators are kind of pointless, you could just teleport, but um, people make very realistic, um, all, all kinds of things that are completely unnecessary, but uh, that people like to, to do, so.
Um, anyway, that's my talk. Sort of extended beyond the time that I had, but uh, thank you so much for being here. And if you have any questions or want to talk afterward, or you know, thank you. Oh, and yeah, if, if you want to email me, by the way, uh, if you want actually the slides, um, my email is just my last name at ucsb.edu. So uh, if you want the links to the, the stuff I have, like the different links or the text file itself, uh, just feel free to contact me as well.